In this episode, I am honored to talk with a legend of sports analytics in general and baseball analytics in particular. I am, of course, talking about Jim Albert. Jim grew up in the Philadelphia area and studied statistics at Purdue University. He then spent his entire 41-year academic career at Bowling Green State University, which gave him a wide diversity of classes to teach from intrastats through doctoral level. As you'll hear, he's always had a passion for Bayesian education, Bayesian modeling, and learning about stats through sports. I found that passion fascinating about Jim, and I suspect that's one of the main reasons for his prolific career. Really, the list of his writings and teachings is impressive. Just go take a look at the show notes. Now an emeritus professor of Bowling Green, Jim is retired but still an active tennis player and writer on sports analytics. His blog, Exploring Baseball with R, is nearing the 400 post mark. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 85, recorded May 5, 2023. <music> Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, for any info about the podcast, learnbaystats.com is la place to be, show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbaystats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.andora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbaystats.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo control? science like I'm Richard Feynman. Hello, my dear Bayesians. First, I would like to warmly thank Joshua Mill for his support on Patreon. It's the podcast main source of funding and it wouldn't be possible without you. And Josh, you're in luck because as of now, patrons of the show can join the episode recordings live to listen and ask questions to the guests. I usually post the link in the LBS Slack channel a couple days before recording. Hope that you'll join us then. And now let's go on with the episode. Jim Albert, welcome to Learning Vision Statistics. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, thank you for taking the time. I'm actually very grateful to have you on the show and very grateful to Bob Carpenter, who actually put us in contact. So thanks a lot, Bob, if you are listening to this episode. Bob was on the show a few episodes ago. I will, of course, put his episode in the show notes of this one. So yeah, thanks for taking the time, Jim. And I'm super excited to talk about sports analytics today. It's going to be very fun. Great. Yeah, so let's dive in. But as usual, we'll start with your origin story. Because um, yeah, I'm very curious to know, you've done so many things, but I'm curious to know about the beginnings. Like, How did you come to the world of statistics and sports analytics and how sinuous of a path was it? Okay, of course, growing up, I was always interested in sports and I was also, Mm -hmm. um, I liked math. (laughs) So uh, I was interested in statistics early on and um, I played baseball and I was, I've been lucky to play tennis my whole life. And so my, my tennis was a part of my family. My dad was a very good player. So that was sort of nice. So I uh, played simulation games in my basement, games like uh, Stratomatic Baseball. And I wasn't a real good baseball player, but I was a baseball fan. And so I was a math, I was good at math. And I didn't quite know where that would lead me in terms of a, a profession. But I went to Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. And I was a math major. And then that's where I was exposed to statistics. 
we had a few stat professors that were very influential to me. And so I wanted to apply, apply math somehow. And I didn't quite, I'm not sure I really understood what, what statistics was about, but I was fortunate to go to Purdue, you know, and I had a very, I thought I was going to do operations research, which I didn't quite, I thought that was a nice blend of math and probability and different things. But, uh, but it turned out that I was just sort of put into the PhD program in statistics. So I was, um, that's where I was. And the professor across the hall from me was Jim Berger. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to know him pretty early. I mean, he, in fact, he only had come to Purdue a couple of years before me. So he, he was very young. I took my first Bayesian course with him. It was a course in decision theory with uh, using Tom Ferguson's book. And uh, so when I was looking for an advisor, you know, he was a natural person to ask because I knew he was, and I knew him sort of uh, informally. And uh, he was very easy to work with. Um, a more of a helpful friend than really a um, like a tyrant. He was very he was very easy to talk to and uh, available, and um, so I was very lucky. But back in those days, he had done a lot of work in simultaneous estimation, uh, variations of Stein estimation, and uh, so he basically said, "Well, why don't you work on something which is away from the the normal mean case? Why don't you start looking at things like you know Poisson means or other types of parameters?" and he we were looking for more practical kinds of, uh, of procedures. And uh, so right away, he said, well, why don't you look at these Efren and Morris papers? So I was reading those, and those were very influential. Now, I should mention, this is a, a notable time to talk about that because um, Cara Morris, a great statistician, just passed away this week. And so, um, and one thing that was notable about, about Carl and Brad Efren is they both like sports. And uh, so they incorporated um, sports examples into their research. They have a famous paper where they look at um, collection of batting averages, and they talk about shrinkage to an average. And also, uh, Carl had wrote a paper in the early 80s. It was called like Parametric um, Empirical Bayes Estimation for JAZA. And one of the examples was um, uh, batting averages for Ty Cobb. And uh, one of the questions he was asking was, uh, is Ty Cobb really a 400 batting hitter? In other words, was his true batting ability over 0.4. So we're not talking about his performance. We're talking about his ability, which is measured by a probability of, of getting a base hit. So uh, so, they were, so that was a big part of what... And also, I think Carl was also a, a tennis player. And he wrote a paper back one of the early days of tennis analytics about the most important point in tennis. So, uh, so we had a lot of things in common. So I was lucky to be exposed to, to that. And so my thesis was on was estimating um, Poisson means from a, like an empirical base perspective. This is before um, MCMC in simulation. We didn't have um, able to, we couldn't do the computations for these uh, posteriors, but uh, but the ideas were there. So then I got my first job at uh, in the math stat department at Bowling Green State University. We moved to Ohio. My whole academic career I spent at Bowling Green. So that's sort of a, a quick description of my of my background, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's so interesting that, yeah, basically sports and math was really something you you were into since since you were a, a young child. I find that very interesting because, like for me, my personal path, for instance, was extremely, extremely sinuous. So that's very interesting to me. And But that being said, how come, like if you were really into, into tennis, how come you've made most of your analysis on baseball? Well, baseball is remarkable for all the data collected. And I think um, baseball was sort of the, to me, it's the most statistical sport in the sense that there's more data collected by it. So baseball started professionally like the uh, 1800s, 1870s or so. And right away, they were computing things like batting average and runs and uh, Singles, doubles, home runs, and uh, and even now, I think the amount of data collected is remarkable. So I think that that's sort of driven maybe the interest in the sport is that there is so much much statistical information. And in the old days, it was put into big books, <laughs> big thick books, and um, and now there've been efforts like, um, for example, RetroSheet is a, a public sort of a ground grassroots effort to um, make play by play data accessible. And so, literally, you can look at plays from every from old seasons, every single play. And now we have what's called Statcast data, where there's data on every single pitch in terms of the, uh, you know, in terms of the speed and the break and the the type. And then we also know what when a ball is hit, 
we know the launch angle and we know the exit velocity and there's even more detailed information now about uh, where people are on the field we can talk about player speeds their range and fielding i mean it's all all available now and i think that's i think baseball was probably the um the first sport to really seriously use that data to answer um meaningful questions mm, yeah yeah i mean return to the future like the book he one of the characters has is about baseball history right where he manages to make a fortune because he goes back to the past and uh, get that book it's because i think it's about baseball already even though like the the movie's already quite quite old so yeah i can see what you mean so okay i understand and that actually goes back it goes into something i wanted to talk about with you because yeah i have the feeling that so at the prior uh, we're on a Bayesian show. <laughs> so I have the prior that, yeah, baseball is more advanced on that analytics path compared to other sports. And then also like the US in itself, so maybe more advanced than other countries, but we'll get back to that. But yeah, basically, can you, you started already doing that, but can you br give us a very brief history of baseball analytics in the US and then also tell us how advanced baseball is on that path today compared to other sports? Okay, so basically, uh, back in the early 60s, people were starting to do meaningful uh, d information about baseball. There was a person named George Lindsay, and he, his dad will actually record play-by-play -play information while he was watching the game. And so there's this idea called run expectancies, which is like the potential for scoring runs given a certain number of bases, on number of outs, and people on base. That work was published in the early 60s, but things were pretty quiet. And then probably the most famous person who got things going was Bill James. He was actually just a, um, he didn't have a, didn't have a, he had, didn't have a formal math background, but he would, uh, he started writing about baseball in the early 80s or maybe the late 70s. And uh, there's this uh, book called The Baseball Abstract, where he basically, he would do things like a statistician. He would um, answer, he would ask reasonable questions and try to use data to answer them. And he was also a very good writer. So he had made a tremendous impact. The whole field is called sabermetrics. And partly it's called sabermetrics because back in the 70s, a new society, a new organization organized called Saber, which is the Society for American Baseball Research. And that's still very active today. And so when that started, then Sabermetrics was sort of the the people in that organization who focused on uh, doing statistical work with baseball. It's really, um, since Bill James and then the book Moneyball came out about 20 years ago, or more than 20 years ago, and that essentially made the, idea, the whole idea of Moneyball was you're trying to, you're a general manager of a team, in this case Oakland, and they're trying to efficiently use resources and so they, they weren't a big market team, so they didn't have the money to spend uh, on players. And so instead, they try to find players with talents that were undervalued. And uh, one un undervalued talent was the ability to get on base. And so they got people who maybe were not famous, but they were successful in getting on base. So basically, that the book and eventually the movie sort of made the whole idea very popular. Oakland at the time was one of the relatively few teams that really spend a lot of effort on sabermetrics. Now, every team in baseball, all 30 teams, have significant uh, analytics groups, some more than others. But it's perceived to be a big deal, especially in terms of um, scouting players, predicting future success. That's really a big, big enterprise. And uh, I used to tell students, students would say they want to get a job in baseball, and I would say, that's nice, but there's not much available. Now the opportunities are really remarkable. I mean, if you got if you really have your um, if you're really enthusiastic, and you have some project or you know you've written a blog post or something, you can get a job as an intern. I mean the the opportunities are there now. Other sports like football, American football and basketball and soccer, they're coming. They're behind baseball, but they're catching up. But right now, I mean, there's nothing like the amount of effort in baseball. I mean, I know friends who work for football teams, but American football, it's more like, it's a very small group of people that do that. Although American football is the most popular sport, the use of analytics is still a bit limited. The opportunities are there, and I think it'll continue to advance. 
ice hockey is exciting because the pace of the game is so fast that you need to collect data to really understand what's happening on the on the ice. You know, otherwise you you miss things. Baseball is a is a slower game, um, a little more discreet than say football or or um, basketball or or soccer. It's probably in some sense easier to analyze, but the technology is here. We can now track balls that are hit, like in soccer, we can track where the ball is on the field. And in basketball, we can track the locations of the players in positioning. So now it gets to be it's much more of a spatial type of um, analysis. Yeah, and you have like all the history and basically the, the advantage of the first comer in baseball, where it's like also much more ingrained into the way of thinking, into probably the way of managing the teams and the data science, no, I mean, the data science teams, I don't know if that's the name, but you get what I mean. The modeling teams maybe have more access to the, the sports teams, stuff like that. I don't know, like you have some insights about that. But um, yeah, so I think um, the team, the amount of data that teams have is really remarkable. Literally every second of the game, there's movement of players in the field and that's all all available to the teams. So I think it's really, for example, one thing, one aspect of baseball that was difficult to measure was fielding. Because in the old days, they would just measure whether you, um, if you made a play, whether you made it successfully, or if you didn't make a play, it was called an error. But what if you didn't reach the ball? Well, that was never measured. See, <laughs> because, you know, there was no way of measuring it. Now, we can talk about the probability of balls like 10, 10 yards from you. We can talk about the probability you should get it. So we can talk about uh, your speed at getting there. We can talk about your range. You know, we can talk about catch probabilities. That's all. So really, we, we're getting a, a better, much better understanding about fielding. It's not a secret anymore. Well, for many years, it was sort of a, you know, we, uh, the data we had was very incomplete. Yeah. And how do they, how do they get that data? Is that with cameras? Or is that sensors on the players? The Hawkeye system, which is used for like tennis, for marking locations of balls, that's being used in all sports now. So I think that technology is used. And so when a ball is hit, we know exactly where it lands in the field. All the players are tracked. So we know where the players are moving. So that's all measurable nowadays. Yeah, it's incredible. Like basically we're starting to get Data is oil, is the oil of the, of the right. modeling. So basically we're starting to get the oil and now we can, we can work on actually building the, the engines and the cars. Right. Yeah, it's so cool. So I think all these teams must have tremendous um, databases. And so you need people that yeah. can build, build these databases. You want to extract information fast. But obviously you also need modelers. And I think Bayesians are even asked, sometimes the job description will re require you to have some experience in Bayesian modeling. So that's roughly a, an important aspect of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. As an open source en enthusiast, <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if they have some shared databases because I'm guessing like some of the data could be shared across everybody and some of the data should probably remain a secret, but I'm guessing that nobody's shared across teams, right? Well, the Major League Baseball has a... Uh, a component of Major League Baseball is called Advanced Media, advanced media and that currently is... Um, the web presence of that is called Baseball Savant, and that's got the high level. Now, some of that data is publicly available. So I can, for example, I can every day I download the um, data for the previous games. So I, for example, I focus a, a lot on home runs. And for every home run hit, I know the launch angle, I know the exit velocity, and I probably have the, um, the distance. So that data is available to anybody who wants to get that. Now, the, the extra data, like the um, locations of fielders, that's probably, again, available through that same organization, and that's supplied to the teams. So the teams probably have pretty much the same data. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the modeler in me is already thinking about hierarchical models and, and stuff like Right. That. I mean, to me, that hierarchical modeling is, is, is extremely natural in that setting because you want to you're often looking at a, a collection of different uh, hitters or fielders or teams. And that's uh, so when you have data exactly. in groups like that, that lends well, self well to hierarchical modeling. Yeah. 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 Like, I mean, uh, just thinking about it like team hi hierarchies and also position hierarchies. Right. Like, right. Would right, be right. The, the two main ones that I would think of right now. Yeah. And is that like, so basically, baseball has always been on the forefront on that. Thing, as you were saying on these analytics, what is the 
current frontier? Like, what are the current frontiers of baseball analytics right now? Like, the biggest answers people are looking for right now in, in the baseball analytics world. One thing we don't quite understand is maybe the um, how teams work together, because team is a collect getting like defense is a collective enterprise. It's not just one player. And so like two key players are the the second baseman and the shortstop. They play in the middle of the field. And the question is, how do they work together? I don't think we have a good a good sense of how to measure that, more or like less synergy or something between those two players. We don't know much about, there's a lot, of, you hear a lot about team chemistry or the ability to work together as a team. I don't think we have a good sense of how that's measured. Uh, the coaching, what's the value added to coaching <laughs> or is a baseball manager really a um, important position? You know, you hear about different styles of management. Some people are more the um, like to play, be more like the players and talk at their level. Other managers like to be more like dictators, where they're making calling the shots. I mean, what's the often teams will vacillate between the two kinds of managers. I'm not sure we really understand again the value of that thing. So I think we're still. Those are things are harder to understand. Those things are very important for teams winning or losing. Yeah, that makes sense. These are the main questions right now for baseball. And, and thank you for like painting that whole drawing for us, the, the current landscape. And right now, I'd like to de-zoom a bit. You've been talking about sports in the U.S., I'm European. <laughs> so, of course, I want to compare to it. And I'm really into sports. I love it. Something I can notice, though, just from my standpoint, which is way less specialized than yours, is it feels like Europe is quite behind compared to the U.S. on that front, especially for football, I mean, soccer. In So I don't know, like, my feeling is that England, like the Premier League, for instance, is way more advanced, it sounds to me, than, for instance, the French League or the Continental Leagues, for instance. So I'd like to get your... Yeah, basically your expertise on that. How is Europe faring in all this in comparison to the US? What's the state of the data science market on these? Football or, or soccer is the big frontier now in sports analytics because I think there's more yeah. there's more interest internationally in that sport than any other sports. Mm -hmm. But obviously it's harder to measure because it's not about scoring goals. It's about movement of players on the field, about making plays. And I think that's all spatial. That data is being recorded now. We're starting to get a handle on that. But how do you measure that? Or how do you measure a player's performance given that spatial data? That to me is the really, to me, the exciting aspect of soccer of how to you know, work with that. I think we're starting because it's not about, honestly, it's not about scoring goals because goals are relatively unlikely events, right? They're relatively rare events. And so if you just focus on goal scored, you're a bit limited in terms of what you can do. But if you talk about plays or about advantage, spatial advantages on the field, right? And that's what I, you would, as a team, you want to you wanna have those spatial advantages. Well, what, what does that mean? How do you measure that? What are the key players on a team that will give you that spatial advantage? So, but again, it's not a, like baseball, which is a discrete process it's rather a continuous spatial process right but the, the point is the data is there so the data is available and so i think the teams are just starting to build up analytics groups to work with that so i think modeling is a a big part of that especially bayesian modeling where you want to sort of borrow strength from different teams or time frames or you know yeah we'll get to that modeling part in a few minutes okay yeah i get what you mean and <laughs> And that's definitely also the, the thing I, I get. One of the interesting thing I think is how much more conservatism there seems to be in the in the soccer world in continental Europe. Like if I'm playing dumb for now, like if and so for the sake of I like to entertain the different arguments. So basically one of the main critiques you will get about any kind of modeling in Western Europe for soccer will be related to a kind of the kind of critiques you will hear about automation. 
So you're trying to get the humans out of the loop. It makes the game less interesting. Basically, it makes, it turns players, human players into robots, basically. The, these people will basically say that and question the importance of sports analytics in that way. So can you talk a bit about that and tell us why sports analytics important and e why is it turning humans into robots or, or not? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, in baseball, for example, there's a lot of um, people who think we've gone too far where, you know, managers will make, um, like, for example, one big decision a manager's got to make in baseball is how long do you keep the pitcher in the game? And so the pitcher will throw pitches and the feeling is once they've hit a certain limit, then their, their effectiveness goes down. Or maybe when they face the other team's lineup for like a third time, then suddenly there's like a drop off. And so managers often will make a decision solely on the analytics <laughs> so that this pitcher has thrown 100 pitches, therefore he's coming out. Or this pitcher is coming out because he's been, he's going to face a batter for the third time and we don't want that. Yeah. The critics would say they're just acting like robots. <laughs> they're just, um, they're like machines and they're, they're just re reacting to data. Well, rather, the reality is that every pitcher is different, every game is different, and you have to make subjective judgments on what to do. Soccer is the same way. I think analytics are going to help you learn about important aspects to winning. And I think you need to know that because otherwise you may make some obvious mistakes in putting in players or certain types of plays. But beyond that, there's always going to be the, you've got to always uh, react to the situation and improvise. And that's always going to be part of sports. <laughs> so I think we need some basic intelligence to understand. So for, for example, how do you value like a soccer player? How do you evaluate how good, he, how good is he? Especially when he's not a, a scorer, he's a defenseman or a midfielder. Well, you're not going to, not going to measure him uh, by the number of goals he scores, right? But you need some measure. And it isn't, it isn't necessarily raw speed. It's um, their ability to react in cer cer certain situations or their ability to, to make plays or give their team an advantage. And th I think you need some sort of um, analytical tools to understand that. Because I don't think our ability to just to look at somebody is that great in terms of evaluating their performance. <laughs> I completely agree with that. And I, I mean, you have a lot of examples of <laughs> at least French football clubs who are just, which are just still, you know, recruiting players based on that instinct way of doing things, basically. And right now, that's why I'm, a, no, of course, biased and but fervent enthusiast about more modeling in these kind of cases because there is still a long way to go before the players and the managers become robots. Like for now, this is way more done by just instincts and gut feeling. And there is a lot of clubs where it just doesn't work at all because there is so many variables that you have to take into account that a lot of those biases are basically not taken into account when you when you recruit a player and just like can mess up a whole a whole recruitment project. Yeah, in, in American football, what's interesting is that, that we just recently had our draft, big NFL draft for the draft players. Uh, yeah. Before they have a draft, they have this what's called a combine where they put all these college players through all these different tests, like running tests or strength tests. And so everyone is measured in all these different attributes. And the question is, does that define a football player? No, because even though you might have a great speed or great great uh, jump, jumping ability or something, it doesn't mean that you're going to play well. There's something, you know. Another thing we don't understand well in sports is how important is the, um, is the mental composition of the player, you know, and so their maturity or something like that. And I'm not sure we can measure that. that I mean, we know that's important, but how do we measure that? So, uh, you know, I think... Uh, a lot of times uh, teams will worry about their what these players do when they aren't playing football or another sport, <laughs> right? And sometimes they get into trouble, right? Or they have some problems. And but those things are all important because that makes that makes that defines the individual. 
But how do you quantify those kind of issues is sort of interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, so I'm curious about what you're saying, but I think that's also where and why patient statistics can can fare extremely well here because it's not a black box approach where you just put in the data and and predict and, and, and fit and predict. It's something that takes in the scouts, domain knowledge that's a hard earned knowledge from years of experience, but balances it with data and with a way of writing down your priors and your biases that you don't have when you're just making gut instinct decisions. And so that's why I think here patient statistics can bring a lot to the table when it comes to sports analytics. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, I mean, prior information is is available, but the challenge is how do you quantify that in, into priors, you know? And, mm-hmm. and decisions oh, okay. on, on modeling, for example, it's not off, often clear what type of model you choose. So you often often choose different alternatives and there are a lot of issues involved in terms of like a computation could be a big issue, you know? Um, maybe mm-hmm. the models you want to use are just not computationally tractable, so you have to do something else. Mm. So, can you like do you have an example in in mind of something like that where actually putting down the priors in a model is uh, has proven complicated? Well, I'm thinking about well, I I think what it's well, that's a good question. I mean, I'm, it's easy to talk about um, like spatial problems, for example. I mean, how do you we're talking about spatial parameters? That's probably a harder thing to talk about a prior on, right? Or even when even to be non-informative or weakly informative, how do you s- construct priors with that kind of weak information? We're exposed to like typical Bayesian cores will focus on exponential family models where you have single parameters, you know, that describe things. That's pretty simplistic to the problems we talk about in sports. Because uh, again, a spatial problem, what is the so maybe you don't want to use a parametric density, for example, to describe things. If we're talking about locations of players, that's more of a a density estimate, right, of something. And uh, this is a little more non-parametric. It's not a you know a simple thing like a normal or binomial model. Mm, I see. Do you think it's something that's possible to deal with on the software side? So, for instance, like as when we develop the tools when we develop PIMC or the Stan devs, when they develop Stan or stuff like that, or the RVs devs, when they are developing new plots and stuff like that. Do you think that's doable? That's something we could be able to deal with on that end? Or it's more something that it's a lost in translation problem between the modeler and the domain experts where it's hard to cross the bridge between you talking about the distributions and that domain expert not really knowing what you're talking about and you like you have a problem crossing that bridge. One thing that's challenging in sports is that often the people doing the analytics are not the ones making the decisions. And so you need a dialogue between the those two groups. And so we really need to have conversations where the people who are really making the decisions are expressing their beliefs and you have to somehow quantify that into some sort of models. That's sort of a challenge. And I think um, I think the challenge is not necessarily the, to me, once you've got a statistical problem defined, it's relatively easy to, to get a reasonable answer. But the challenge is to think of a reasonable statistical problem. And there you have to f- work with the people who are working with the team, you know, have the issues and then get them to, to express their, or scouts, you know, they're talking about players' performances. Well, they're not using the same language as we're using, but somehow you got to, as you said, you got to build build that bridge so you can communicate. It's more something that goes in, like during the, the Bayesian workflow, the modeling workflow, where it's prior, it's on the prior elicitation part more than just a technical issue, let's say, that's something that would make, that would be made easier with, a software tool. I think it really think about a consulting work where you work with somebody from a different field and probably the most important meeting is the first one where you get a sense of what the problem is and really understand the the issues and then this is way before you talk about any statistical approach you're just trying to just get a sense of um, what they're and often they have a hard time expressing what the problem is. 
So the challenge for the statistician is to try to put that in sort of terms that make sense for, to him and also the person looking for the help. Yeah, that's super interesting. And that's definitely something also like any consulting projects we have, <laughs> for instance, with, with PyMC Labs, our consulting firm is like a lot of the work is focused on that, like making sure we're all sitting priors in a good way and in a way that's understandable to to people, especially business people. So yeah, because like in a way, business people don't really care about, oh, I'm using a gamma per um distribution for that parameter. Um like they like they don't really care. So No, no, they don't think in those terms, right? Right. But they have beliefs and they can express those. Exactly. Yeah. And if anything, sometimes it can even like backfire because some people are really intimidated by math and stats. And when you start, uh, you know, shouting distributions and names of distributions and Greek letters, it's just like people can shut off completely because they aren't too intimidated. So, right. Well, uh, definitely something to be cur- uh, careful about. I mean, in that respect, for instance, uh, um, an addition we made to the PyMC package based on those type of interactions with clients is the new find constraint priors distribution where it really came from work with clients where we were uh, basically trying to elicit priors and basically people would tell us, well, I think that parameter should be positive and most of the time it's going to be between 0.1 and 0.4. And so basically you as the modeler is like, okay, so that means I need a gamma distribution with about, I don't know, 95% of the mass of the distribution between 0.1 and 0.4. How do I get that distribution? But then the business person doesn't care about that. But at least when she gives she gives you that information, well, you have your prior. And then, well, you can use PyMC to get the the actual gamma distribution that you, you would need to use with that find constraint priors function. So actually, yeah, we're already talking about models, so that's cool, uh, because I wanted to switch a bit towards that. But before that, I'm actually curious if you remember how you first got introduced to Bayesian methods and and why they sticked with you. Well, step. I was, again, I was very lucky that I got introduced to um, Bayes through Jim Berger. And so I really... And I think at that point, there was no real Bayesian text available. I mean, Jim was Jim Burst working on a book, his uh, decisionary book. But um, so really, I was learning it more from a de- decision theoretic perspective, you know, putting priors on things. To me, it always seemed very natural. And I could see, I mean, there were some obviously issues with p-values, for example. And uh, you when you started looking carefully at p-values and contrast it with... Um, Bayesian measures of evidence, you had very, got very different answers, and it made you ask, you know, what what's really going on, and uh, and so I think I got exposed to those that kind of idea, and um, and the other idea that uh, you know likelihood principle was so important. So if you collect data, let's say you have binary data, and you let's say you get uh, twenty successes, twenty trials, and you get uh, twelve successes. Instead, you might, um, you know, continue the experiment until you have 12 successes. Well, does that matter? <laughs> well, not if you believe that the likelihood principle is, is dominant. But if you're a frequentist, it matters in- entirely because you have two different distributions. You've got a, a negative binomial and a, and a binomial, which are different distributions. So you get different p-values and different measures of evidence. And so you've, I started thinking about that kind of stuff pretty early in my graduate career. So when I went to Bowling Green, you know, teaching a Bayesian course was sort of a natural thing to do because, you know, I had that background. So right away, I was teaching a master's level course. But then at the same time, I was also, um, we were teaching a lot of intro stat at the same time in the department. And I saw, I was very, um, let's say, I didn't think that the approach we were using in the intro stat was doing, was really um, working. I mean, students were learning recipes and it didn't really understand what they were doing, and uh, they didn't understand the um, the frequentist interpretation of confidence, for example, the idea that you don't you don't have confidence in a certain per- certain method, rather you only have confidence in repeated sampling, which is very very counterintuitive, <laughs> because yeah, right. So um, I think right away I said, well, we really need. I mean, I was aware there were some efforts to teach intro Bayes at that level. And I said, well, why don't we 
try, we really should try that <laughs> at that intro level because I didn't, I felt like we were, uh, I thought inference was really a lost cause from a frequentist perspective at that level. The students who just have an algebra, college algebra background, that it got, inspired me to sort of look at that seriously. And the person who um, really um, influenced me was Don Barry because he had a book that was um, exactly on that, on just basically intro stat, discrete models. You know, it didn't get much attention at the time, but I thought that was a really good book. The only thing I'd, the only problem with the book is that it really was, it had very little um, computational facilities. And so things like, uh, even with discrete priors, there was no software connected with the, the book. And so that inspired me to write some mini tab macros to try to supplement that. So my first book was actually a collection of mini tab macros for doing Bayesian calculations. And that was my early, early book. And um, it didn't, it wasn't successful in the sense that Minitab uh, changed their language. And so what I had written wasn't going to work with the new, the new macros. And, you know, there was a problem with that. But that really was the foundation for, uh, for developing. At that time, I was using a MATLAB for computation. So I developed a, a collection of MATLAB functions for implementing a lot of these, um, these calculations, basic calculations. And then MATLAB eventually became R. <laughs> when R became available, I just took those MATLAB routines and, uh, and translated them to R. And so I wrote a book then called Basing Computation with R, and that was, uh, was really a, um, the, the, the routines I was using for my graduate course. So basically, I also wrote, again, before I wrote that competition book, I wrote an intro uh, base book. And really, I, I wanted to do it from two different perspectives. First, I wanted to do Bayesian, Bayes ideas instead of frequentists. And second, I like the idea of active learning, where the students are learning through activities and a sort of workshop style. And so Alan Rossman and Beth Chance had written some books like that that were pretty popular. So what I did essentially was to work with Alan Rossman and used his data part and then added a probability and Bayesian component to that book. So that became my, my intro Bayesian book. And we used it at Bowling Green for a while. The problem we had was the book book was fine. The students uh, could do little Bayesian projects, but the problem is that we were trying to do that together with like some sections would do the Bayesian thing, some sections would do frequentist, and we just had so many sections. And having the two styles of of classes was hard, to, hard, to, hard to work with because we were working with like thirty sections of classes and. So eventually, we we went back to the traditional just because of uh, of management issues. <laughs> it was not because I mean the Bayesian approach was working, but you needed somebody in charge who was more had more of a Bayesian background. So it was harder for a beginning graduate student to teach that course. So that's why we went back to a more of a traditional thing. But the but the approach worked fine, and I think I was encouraged by that. And the more intuitive interpretation, basically. Right. So the, the focus in that intro book was. Um, Using discrete priors. So, for example, for proportion, you you make a list of values you think are appropriate. You assign weights to those values. That becomes your prior, and then you just you can you have simple routines that will once you observe some data, will convert those to pro- posterior probabilities. But the nice thing about that approach is that it's easy to do inference because it's just based on a table of probabilities. Your posterior estimate is just the like a posterior mode. You collect values which have a certain probability content. That's your your credible interval. It was very easy to do inference. Actually, I'd like to talk a bit more about your educational part because yeah, you've you've written a lot of books. You've you've taught a lot. So yeah, let's talk a bit about that. And then afterwards, if we have some time, I'd like to dive a bit more into the specific specifics, maybe of a sports analytic model. But to dezoom a bit because we've being a bit technical also. So yeah, as I was saying, you're also a professor and you're very passionate about stats education. So I'm curious, what are the most important skills that you try to instill in your students? I think it is a challenge to be a Bayesian because students typically, especially at the graduate level, students have already, um, you know, have some training from frequent statistics. So to me, when you're a Bayesian, it, it sort of, turn things around a bit. I mean, and so it's a different perspective. And um, so I think you need to contrast Bayesian answers with frequentist answers. And it's not like frequentist answers are bad, 
but it's a different way of thinking about things, you know, different ways of thinking about conclusions, certain aspects. I mean, obviously, one big advantage is that you can bring prior information to the table. And I think that's one big advantage. I think and you have to give them examples where prior information matters. And I think um, from the viewpoint of combining information, multi-level models are very, very attractive. And I think those are naturally done from a Bayesian perspective because they essentially are, are Bayesian models. So I think, and I think also the students have to be somewhat to become computationally savvy <laughs> in some sense. I mean, they have to be familiar with using simulation, with writing some code to do their work. We're not really using uh, canned programs to, to get answers. Rather, we're using algorithms. And it's sort of helpful to understand how the algorithms work. You don't just use, I mean, so especially when I, I like to teach, introduce MCMC through Metropolis and Gibbs because those are relatively easy to understand. You know, also easy to program. Stan is a bit more complicated, although it has some similarities with um, like Metropolis algorithms. I think uh, it's a bit more sophisticated. And I really, I think I'm a little resistant to using Stan at first. I think you need to have some experience with other algorithms first because I think there's Stan can become too much of a black box if you aren't familiar with some of the, the algorithms involved. Yeah, you mean if you're not familiar with the basics of MCMC? Yeah, I can see what you mean. Especially, I mean, you could say the same for PyMC, for instance, where like, if you don't know anything about the, the algorithm that's running in the background, uh, you will just ignore the divergencies or the target accept warnings and just use the, the model as it is, even though you shouldn't. That's to explain what a divergence means, right? You need to understand the algorithm before that makes any sense, right? And there is this amazing small web app that's basically a dem video demonstration of how MCMC works. I'll always forget the name of the person who did that. I'm, I'm very sorry, but that will be in the show notes. So if you folks, uh, when I look at that, I really encourage it because it shows you basically you can slow down or increase the speed of the sampling and you basically see the MCMC algorithm going through the posterior space and you will see how each sample is accepted or rejected and you can try different MCMC algorithms. So like the classic Gibbs one, for instance, very basic, and then you can increase to the very computationally efficient HMC algorithms that Stan and PyMC are, are using today. And that way you can also see what a divergence is, especially if you're asking for a posterior distribution that has a funnel shape or a multimodal shape, then you will see that the algorithm, if it's not tuned well enough, can have divergences and that's how it can give you an intuitions about what that means and why the priors could be at fault also if you get divergences or lots of things. So yeah, I put that into the show notes. And yeah, it's like maybe more of a very brow, broad question. I'm very aware of that, but I'm really curious if you could change one thing in the way stats are taught right now at the level that you were teaching, what would it be? Well, I always thought that the intro level, I mean, I really think that courses that try to be very, very conceptual were more successful. Like, for example, uh, David Moore, a Purdue professor, wrote a series of books. And one of the first books he wrote was called Concepts and Controversies. And rather, it was not a, it wasn't a book about techniques, it was more on ideas and more about illustrations of statistics in society. And that to me is really the way an intro course would be because otherwise, if all you're teaching is a few recipes, students will learn the recipes and five minutes later, they'll forget everything. <laughs> so, but they can, but I think that's why, I mean, I actually um, wrote a book called Teaching Stats Using Baseball. And the reason why I wrote that is because I said, what if we spent the whole course just talking about baseball? And I would focus on players and talk about issues and questions. And the statistical material was always in the background. But I would use methods when they were appropriate. But the students loved the course. And even one student said, oh, this is the most useful course I've uh, taken. Well, that's silly because the course was not useful, but they probably meant they, they understood the context. And so maybe you'll forget the method, 
But you might remember the um, comparing Babe Ruth with uh, Mickey Mantle or that type of thing, or talking about clutch uh, performance and ability. You might remember that. So I think that's what you want. You want to leave the student with these um, memorial is experiences that are they will remember. And uh, I think a lot of times our our basic stack course is glorified mathematics, where you're just learning techniques. And that's not all what statistics is about. It's not about the techniques. It's about the way you think about data. And that's the challenge. And unfortunately, for a beginning graduate student, that's not an easy teaching assignment. It's much easier to teach algebra or to teach methods. It's much harder to bring in things from the news, for example, and talk about the application of that statistics. So by, as I said, I, that's my wish that the course would change that way, but to actually implement that for a large number of sections is a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I really agree with you in that sense. Yeah, for sure. And I, it's something I see and something we really try to teach a lot. Anytime we do teaching with PyMC Labs, we do corporate workshops. So the way we teach or in the intuitive base online courses that I do, really always trying to teach the principles before the methods, because in a way it's the principles that, that are going to save you and that you need to understand, because once you understand the, the core principles, then the methods are quite natural. Because as you were saying, if you are able to think generative manner about your data and then about the model that you want to have, then the method is kind of something accessory that just comes in afterwards once you have thought about the the problem at hand in a principled way. But very often what we see, especially from people who have had a lot of statistics, but from the classic framework, is that very toolbox, basically mentality, or it's like, okay, what's the problem? What's the method? What's this problem has this method? But then when, when the problem is really original, which is often the case, and there is no method, it's a problem. You have no tool in the toolbox and you don't know how to develop the tool. The applied sciences often have a single course where they talk about statistical methods and they're going to focus on the tools they use. And unfortunately, that gives the, the student a very limited viewpoint of what statistics is all about. And again, when they face a new problem, they would have no idea what to do because they're just familiar with certain tools. I'm actually curious if you have a favorite sports analytics model a Bayesian model that you'd like to share with the listeners, like mainly like, yeah, the, the problem at hand and how you came up with the modeling idea and solution. Well, one general thing of interest in baseball, for example, there is a lot of interest on how players perform in different situations. Like, for example, players generally perform better during home games versus away games. They tend to if they're facing a pitcher in the opposite arm, which means that you're right-handed and your pitcher is left-handed, you do better. When there is, there's a lot of interest in how does the player do when the it's an important situation during the game. That's called clutch play. So there's a lot of uh, interest in that kind of situational stats. That discussion leads to basically a, a collection of models that can describe that. And so one model would say that the situation has no effect, that maybe you see some variation, but really there's, like, for example, home versus away, generally there's no difference in home frames versus away games. Another model would say that, yeah, there's an effect, but it's the same across all players. And the most interesting model would say there's an effect, like a home effect, but some players take advantage of that more than other players. So some players really take advantage of being at home. Now, trying to understand why that's the case is interesting. But uh, So those are all Bayesian models. And what you find is that, you know, although people like to, like to talk about clutch ability, you see clutch performances. Players do, occasionally do, but there's no special ability to do better in clutch situations. And it's sort of a controversial uh, conclusion because people like to think that players are clutch or players will do well in stressful situations. But really, through modeling, you learn that the variation you see in data is just like what you would predict with a model that would assume like a constant effect due to the situation. Those type of examples are always worthwhile to do because 
people believe believe in those situations are real. <laughs> Often, like the hot hand in yeah, right. In right. I mean, certain players, like um, one person in baseball, his name is David Ortiz. He sought to be a um, a clutch player. Reggie Jackson was called Mr. October because he performed well at the end of the season. I agree that he is. He did do some nice things in October, but. There is no general tendency of them doing better during the the more important situations. So those models I've done for a while, they're worth revisiting because the conclusions are are sort of at odds with what the baseball people believe. And uh, you know, so I think you have to, you know, learn more what are the really the important variables influence performance. We had a, in fact recently I did a problem. It, a sto- interesting story in baseball is um, home run hitting. In 19, 2019, there was a record number of home runs hit. The question was, why? <laughs> okay, Were the players getting stronger? Were they hitting the balls harder at uh, the right launch angles? Or was it issue of the baseball construction? And it turns out that the way the baseball is made has a tremendous effect on the baseball, uh, effect on the number of home runs. And one thing that you can measure is called the drag coefficient, which is abil- its ability of how the ball moves through the air. And when there is less drag, the ball will carry further. So it's been demonstrated that the baseball has changed in recent seasons. Although it's made in the same plant in Costa Rica, somehow the characteristics of the baseball have changed. And that's had a tremendous effect on home run hitting. Another thing that's been changing is that Pitchers will put, will make the ball sticky by either rosin or saliva or some substance. And if they can make the ball sticky, they can throw the ball with more spin. And when they throw it with more spin, that leads to more favorable outcomes. So again, the baseball world is this is a problem because you know, they they don't want it's like cheating. You're trying to do something to baseball which will make it advantageous for the pitcher. And so maybe the, the solution is to use this ball that's already sticky, <laughs> and then the ball, they won't have able to do that advantage. Everyone will have the same thing. And that's what they're using now in Japan, and they might be using that in baseball. So it's sort of fascinating that the characteristic of the baseball can have a tremendous impact on the performance of players. But those, but then you, can, but you use model, basic models to try to understand those effects. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. And what would the model look like very briefly at a high level for, for that kind of problem. Okay, so a ball, a ball is hit in the air, a ball is hit, and there's a probability of a home run. It's a function of the the launch angle and the exit velocity, but it varies by means of a, a, it's in a smooth way. So a general way of doing that is by a generalized additive model. So you're saying the probability of the home run on the logit scale is a smooth function of the launch angle and exit velocity. And so... Based on that model, that sort of describes how the baseball works in a certain year. And then you can predict from that model and then look at this current year and see what the predictions are for home runs for the current year. And then you get a sense of if predictions are are lower than they were than you they would predict, that means the baseball is not the same as the one they used that previous year. So you're really using a Bayesian prediction exercise to get a handle on how the baseball characteristics change from year to year. And again, every year is the official baseball organization doesn't really tell you what's going on. So you have to learn what's happening through the, the collected data, you know, which is interesting. That makes space even more interesting then. Yeah, this space, this has been an interesting year because um, baseball is, uh, is sort of a long game. And so they've made changes to the game to make it go faster. So now pitchers have to, there's a pitch clock, Pitchers have to throw a ball within a certain time, and the bases are bigger, so it's easier to steal bases. And um, the infielders are not allowed to be in the same locations. They have to be before they would have three all the all the infielders on one side of second base. That's not allowed now, and the all these changes are impacting the game. But we don't understand exactly how they, until we look at the data. Yeah, so it's an interesting season. Damn, super interesting. Thanks a lot for uh, for working us through that, Tim. Before calling it a show and asking you the last two questions, I'd like to de-zoom again and ask you more generally 
what does the future of sports analytics look like to you and what you would like to see and what you would like to not see? It's going to continue to grow. It's probably going to f grow more in other sports before, like baseball right now is sort of at a, I think they have pretty large groups now working for the baseball teams, but that's not happened for other sports. So I think what, what's happening in baseball is going to happen in other sports. And one thing interesting is they're looking at a lot of the same issues. Like, for example, they're looking at the importance of situations. They're looking at the impact of the, of the ball. You know, they're understanding things like that. So ideas from baseball are going to be helpful for understanding other sports. I'm going to be going to a um, seminar. It's called Saber Seminar in um, August. And this is an opportunity for students to make presentations about baseball projects. And most of the Major League Baseball teams are there at this meeting. So it's a wonderful opportunity for these students to, uh, to showcase their talents and get interviews for things like internships and jobs. And so I think that's the model, and I think that's going to that's gonna happen to other sports. And, it's, and again, I think uh, soccer is going to become the next big frontier and it will continue to grow in terms of analytics. I agree. Like soccer is the sport I know the, the best and I can see so many, so many opportunities here and I wish we'll be able to, to help them because I mean, I love sport and I know Bayesian stats can, can bring a lot of value there. We'll see if uh, Western European soccer clubs finally start seriously getting into that. I think they will because the Premier League has already started doing that and that will give them a structural competitive advantage at some point. And, and the, te so, the technology like, is becoming more prevalent too. I think the technology you see at the higher level leagues is eventually become available to lower level leagues, yeah. Okay, well, that was awesome. I already took a lot of your time, so let's call it a show. But, of course, before letting you go, I'm going to ask you the last two questions ask every guest at the end of the show. So if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I've always been fascinated by the learning about team performance or learning about what is special about how the players work together. And that's sort of a challenging problem because I don't think there's a clear methodology for doing that. I think we need to look a little more, you know, and I think it's probably... Maybe baseball is a little more individual sport, but I think sports like basketball and and football, American football are more team-oriented because the players have to work together. And trying to understand that that synergy between players, to me, is a, is a fascinating topic. I think we're going to learn more about that, but I think we have to get beyond our basic models to do that. So I think it's, it's challenging to develop the methodology. But that's the kind of things I've been thinking about yeah. I'm not surprised. You seem very passionate, so I'm not surprised that the the answer is still sports analytics. Oh, right, oriented. right. Well, that's. I, mean, I think that's the one thing that's nice about sports is that it's a sport. Like in baseball, I understand the sport really well, and so it, it gives you a certain intuition. So I, when you get statistical conclusions, they have to somehow agree with what you think, and so sometimes you can discard what you get because it doesn't make sense or you don't have a good explanation for it. And so second. Question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? Well, one person that was very um, remarkable as a statistician because he was pro very prominent in methodology, but also he was very um, uh, interested in education and also interested in sports was uh, Fred Mosteller because he was a remarkable statistician. He was such a, such a wide range of interest. I think that's sort of a, a great model for you know for someone to work in statistics because I think John Tukey said that you can um, work in other people's playgrounds and I think uh, Mostar was wonderful in that way and he had some very influential uh, sports papers he looked at the World Series for example and I think uh, and he looked at golf for example and I think uh, that he'd be a fascinating person to have dinner with awesome well thanks a lot Jim as Usual, I put resources in, in a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. And there will be a lot of things in the show notes because uh, Jim has written an incredible amount of content. So uh, feel free to, to check this out, folks. 
And um, yeah, thanks a lot for taking the time, Jim. I learned a lot. Really fascinated always by sports analytics. So that was really a treat and a pleasure to have you on the show. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Bye, you bet. Thank you. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation.